this panel coming together at Sankalp. Uh, we've had a lot of help from IntelliCap um, and, and my colleague Suda Seti at the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves identifying these speakers. And I really think after our discussion just before this panel, we have an incredible group of people that can both discuss the successes uh, and the, the challenges in terms of financing incredible products for consumers at the base of the pyramid. And when we talk about these products, such as solar lanterns, such as cook stoves, um, water filters and entire solar home systems, there's a lot of work being done, but it's being done in a fragmented way. And those uh, manufacturers, distributors, and MFIs have been finding challenges in terms of the right financial product, the right partner uh, after sales service, as well as some legal barriers and entities in terms of the MFI and providing the right loan. But some of these individuals really have taken a good uh, thought process about this and hopefully we'll come away with a tangible and frank discussion about some of the ways that uh, we can work together to continue to overcome these barriers and really really make uh, financial inclusion and the financial inclusion movement m uh, move towards uh, asset-based finance and getting consumers the products that they would make their lifestyles and their homes that much healthier um, and better. And so uh, I'm very honored to be joined by everyone today. What we'll do is we'll ask each, uh, each individual discuss, to discuss a little bit about their organization, how they've uh, worked on this in the past. They'll give you a little bit of a case study, and then we'll have a, an interesting dialogue, and then we'll open it up for the, uh, for the group and questions. Um, just to give you a quick background on, on why this is incredibly exciting for me and for my organization, the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. As a sector builder, we've been looking at the supply side, the demand side, and the enabling environment, and how do we catalyze a sector for clean cooking uh, stoves and fuels globally. And what we've found is that we've got some great programming on the supply side. We've been doing some advocacy and awareness but we've only seen small one-off projects in terms of partnerships with MFIs, and nobody's really solidified that right business model that can be brought to scale in terms of financing for the product. So that's why we're interested and we're involved and we're excited to learn from the, these individuals today. And with that, I'd like to kick it off uh, with Mr. Ravi Shankar from Fullerton, yeah. who will discuss a little bit about uh, your, your work in this area. My name is Ravi Shankar. I represent Fullerton India Credit Company, which is, a, which is an NBFC. Uh, and uh, we operate in about seven states. Uh, we, are a, we operate in about 20 states, both in the urban and the rural uh, areas. Uh, specifically today, we, uh, I'm speaking to you about our, um, uh, this initiative, which, which we have rolled out in our uh, rural branch network, which is about 180 branches across about 30,000 villages, uh, which covers about 30,000 villages. Uh, and we um, we uh, we have about a million customers today. We have access to about a million households uh, in the rural areas, and uh, through our financial products that we offer to them. And we've identified this need uh, for a variety of products that will help them to improve their standard of living as well as productivity. Uh, many people argue that uh, these are consumption loans, uh, cons uh, consumption products, but I, uh, we see it a little differently. These actually help to enhance, not only enhance the quality of life, but also enhance the productivity overall. Uh, and uh, we uh, faced a lot of, uh, first we started, it, started out uh, this uh, marketing these as a, or creating awareness for these products as a, to fulfill a social objective that we had uh, with the same households that we um, uh, offer financial <coughs> products to. But later we realized that uh, they really are in need of a variety of products and uh, while they need them, they are uh, not able to acquire them. First, they are not aware of them, but even if you create awareness, there is no distribution, the products are not available easily. Uh, and they can't go out and buy these products. If they could do that, uh, they then faced the biggest challenge, which was uh, uh, to get finance uh, for buying these, pro procuring these products. So which is when we actually created something called a merchandise loan, uh, which we've been very successfully uh, successful in implementing uh, across all of these uh, branches. And today we've uh, financed close to about 200,000 units of variety of products from uh, cook stoves uh, to water filters to uh, solar lanterns and now as the aspirations of these villagers are growing, uh, we, these households are growing, they are we are now 
uh, financing uh, home energy solutions which are more expensive and now getting into the farm space where we are uh, marketing solar uh, based uh, solar powered <coughs> pumps as well water pumps so uh, and besides bicycles and a variety of other products so this is this goes hand uh, you know hand in hand with the rest of the products that we uh, finance in the market uh, and specifically on merchandise as i said we've uh, financed over 200000 uh, units cook stoves in particular about nearly 30000 of them uh, across these uh, villages there is a large need for this and there is a need for uh, a variety of agencies to get involved from the financiers that is us like us and uh, distributors uh, and uh, various other agencies that the manufacturer of course uh, and there is always I, i see a space for all three to be involved very closely to be able to get uh, people to reach these products to the uh, end user Uh, and make sure that they ad adopt uh, uh, these uh, new technologies and new products for their own benefit. Yeah. Great, thank you. And I'd like to invite next um, a, a different perspective from an MFI that didn't actually hasn't gone into this market yet, but has been thinking quite heavily about. Uh, consumer finance products and, and diversifying the strategy. So I'd like to invite Mr. Manoj Nambia to discuss a little bit around um, your your organization, Arohan, and how you're looking at this market. Thanks, Kivi. Uh, the company that I work for is a company called Arohan Financial Services. So we are an IntelliCap Group company. We took a controlling stake in this company about a year and a half back. Uh, we are active in the low-income states of West Bengal, Bihar, and Assam. and currently we cover about 230000 customers with a loan outstanding of about 200 crores uh, in our own small way apart from lending uh, and providing micro loans to our customers we've also started piloting uh, services like micro pensions and insurance uh, like i was telling the group before we met here our experience with uh, cross selling is not uh, have not really been very good because uh, frankly the way we see it is that either you can have a very involved process where the mfi really takes on the role of uh, scanning the market understanding what are the right products and then finalizing on something which then is actually uh, you know sort of uh, i mean sold to the to the client alternatively it can be a very access based kind of relationship where you are only providing the sort of manufacturer access to the clients as and when they sort of visit your office uh, the first model is obviously far more involved which brings in a lot of responsibility as far as the mfi is concerned because you are literally putting your neck on the line and suggesting that you've done the research this is the right technology this is the right price we've sort of negotiated the right price and also in a i mean in a certain way assuring them of after sales service so the first thing that that you know that people need to understand when you talk about mfi as a sales channel is that our primary business is lending our primary business is not really cross selling other other uh, you know sort of products and services so to that extent in any activity that we do we see risks and the risk that we see are one is reputation risk so assuming that you've got uh, stuck on a product or a service which doesn't function over a period of time and you having financed it then it's automatically risky for us because it will actually affect our collections uh, second is the liquidity risk obviously if a product is going to cost 2000 rupees or 5000 or 10000 rupees it obviously would need to be financed which means that you are taking on a liquidity risk of ensuring that you have enough funds back in your kitty to actually ensure that you are able to give a bigger loan the third uh, issue is in terms of operational risk which is if you have to buy the product stock it at your office maintain inventory keep tracking in terms of how many have got sold how many have not got sold all that is an additional uh, you know sort of operational headache which actually comes on to you uh, last but not uh, you know not the list it's actually the credit risk which is assuming that you have given a loan automatically in terms of the kind of deferred payment that the customer has to make there is automatically a credit risk in the fact that the customer may not be able to pay a high loan which you've given just to finance uh, you know the arm um, and the product regulatorily also you need to be careful because as mfis uh, as per the rbi guidelines not more than 30% of the loans that you give can actually be for non productive purposes so in all probability things like a water purifier a solar lantern anything else like a cycle would not really be categorized as a fully productive asset right so you have to ensure that uh, you 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 do not fall foul of the regulations which are there by ensuring that 70% of the loans that you've given are actually meant for productive use uh, how disruptive is the process 
So we follow a very regimented approach as far as the field sales officers are concerned. They work in a branch, the branch manager reports to an area manager. So there is a certain process which is already set into place. A typical loan officer would start his operations at about 7.38 in the morning and complete all his collection processes by about 12, 12.30. Right? So any activity which is going to take away time from that particular core activity of his would always be seen as a peripheral activity. Right? And if it does not add to the kind of business that we are doing, then automatically it will be seen as something which is, which is basically a pain. Uh, you have to be careful about what products are you really offering to the BOP customers that we deal with. Is there a real need for that? So, uh, different states can be different, right? For example, in Bihar, it might be a solar lantern which is required, uh, you know, because, because there is no electricity. But if you're looking at, let's say, markets in West Bengal, it might be something different. It might be clean water. So, before an MFI actually gets into this, it needs to do a little bit of a homework on itself with its customers to understand what really are the three, four key pain points which, you know, which sort of need to be addressed. What really sort of concerns us is that typically manufacturers like this tend to see us as just a dealer or a channel. And uh, we've had examples of, of a large cement company which came to us and said that we've developed this magic mitti which can be used by your customers for improving the quality of the dwellings that they actually uh, use. And uh, eventually when the discussions went forward, we sort of realized that they wanted us to stock the cement in our branch, uh, literally converting us into, I mean, into a, you know, I mean, and, uh, I mean into a dealer of cement. So our core business being lending, how do you sort of completely forget that and then start stocking cement bags in your, in your branch? Uh, the financials also matter because obviously the process would involve a certain amount of effort. And if you are really putting your neck on the line in terms of saying that this water purifier is the best, then automatically you need to have done that uh, groundwork. And also for that extra effort that you're putting in, one would expect that the loan officer, the branch manager and the sort of uh, field staff apart from the corporate office, also do get a certain remuneration in terms of the effort which is putting. So that's, that's broadly what, what our take has been. Uh, it's not been very successful. We are currently running a pilot with a mobile phone uh, provider uh, where we have asked them to give us some units uh, for basically a trial period where we are asking our field officers and the field staff to actually use it and then uh, confirm that it's of good quality before we really start taking it to the field. Thank you, Manoj. That's a, a fantastic perspective. So now that you've heard from an MFI that's working on it, and then an MFI that's a little skeptical and is trying with some pilots in the strategy, I'd like to uh, invite Ajayta Shah, uh, who's the CEO of Frontier Markets, and an enterprise that's been really working on both the, uh, the sexes, successes and challenges and addressing this. Uh, thank you. Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, so. I uh, really appreciate actually both feedbacks and perspectives because I think what, uh, what Manoj has been saying, I've been saying for three years. You know, I've been saying that uh, there are fundamental challenges to why microfinance institutions um, cannot do this on their own. Um, but at the same time, uh, why it's so important for people like Ravi to exist and actually try it and, um, and, and understand why the finance piece uh, to get these products to market is so important. Um, and you can fundamentally see numbers change the second you add a finance piece uh, to a lot of these products that we're introducing into market. So uh, when, when I set up Frontier Markets, I really set up Frontier Markets to fill these gaps. Um, we think that um, you know, it's not a question about whether there's a need for these uh, products. It's a question of really making sure that you can identify the right products. Uh, it's also a question of whether you can invest that time effort uh, to actually market and educate the masses on whether or not they really understand these products. Um, and then it's making sure that there's ample amount of supply that is regularly located locally so that people can access these products. And then of course the main, main important piece which I think um, is I think the key of what Frontier Markets does is can you then create presence to provide after sales service so you can be accountable for these products. And I think that if you look at all these four pieces um, that is really what creates then a proper model to get, um, you know, these households to really uh, embrace some of these solutions that we've been saying for such a long time are required, given the challenges that we face in electricity, in, in, in cooking, in water, et cetera. But I think those things are what Frontier Markets can do, and we are doing, but it's really important for us to have partners like Fullerton or like Rohan, who are then there to then add the other really important element, which is 
financing this product. Because today, um, due to economies of scale, or due to uh, latest technology, or due to uh, misalignments with manufacturers, the price point doesn't match their ability for these households to pay for the product, right? And so I think that we understand why it's there. I think all the risks that, um, that, uh, that Manoj mentioned are exactly the reasons why people aren't taking this initiative. But at the same time, um, I think the reason why we can work with people like Fullerton, and we are uh, in Rajasthan, is because um, the scale for us is also important, right? We need partners that can allow us to really create scale fast and really access these channels in a very different way and provide that loan. Now, I think that what's been interesting for us with our experience with Fullerton is that um, they've been doing some incredible work uh, before we ever existed, uh, but I think the cost reduction, the increase in sales, uh, the better uh, assessment of products and trust factor have changed quite drastically ever since we did start working together. And I think that's really been an important player, part of this. The other major thing that I think that we do, and we were talking about this earlier, is that you know, I don't think it's a microfinance institution's role to spend all of their time trying to figure out which product they should bring into market. Because there's a lot of due diligence that needs to happen. And really, um, it's not one cook stove company that you're looking at, you're looking at 150. And so um, testing that and that risk on, in testing that is also very dangerous. So it's something that we need um, sector-related people to actually do for us, right? That can actually tell us that you know, these products are certified, they work, and all the risks that you would potentially be taking, you, know, you won't be taking because we are actually putting our stamp on this, right? So an example of that is you know, what IFC is doing with Lighting Asia certifying products that are telling you that they're actually high quality products so some of the basic risks won't be there anymore or things that, that you know the global alliance between cook stoves is doing also helping us understand how do you look at 150 cook stoves and choose three that are relevant for you um, and then of course the other major piece of this is um, I think which is none of our responsibilities uh, is that there is a concept marketing uh, requirement that's a lot more expensive um, and a lot more challenging, which even us as a value-add distributor or a microfinance institution cannot do properly. And so I think that, that there's a space right now for, again, sector responsibilities, similar to what I've seen, I know Santosh is going to talk about this in terms of cook stoves, that they can play a role that helps us really uh, make this uh, more effective at scale and make this into a market-based solution. Thank you, Ajayta. And without further ado, then, um, I think we've all discussed a need for a different role here. So I'll allow Santosh uh, from GIZ to discuss what you've been working on in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm representing GIZ here. Uh, for those who are. It's not working. No, hold the mic closer. It's okay now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm representing GIZ. Uh, GIZ is a German government-owned enterprise uh, which implements development projects across 130 countries. In India, we are implementing a, you know, a large-scale program funded by German Ministry of Economics uh, and Development and the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. This is one other program that we are working apart from. There are several other programs GIZ is implementing. And uh, the program I work for has a mandate which says that how to develop sustainable business models for providing clean energy in rural areas. So the focus is on sustainable business models in clean energy in rural areas. So the, all the three are really uh, challenging things. So we have been working here for quite some time and uh, uh, the way we decide to work on a particular topic and, and that's crucial for you to understand like how we <coughs> do a lot of work that we first go into negotiations with the government and then we decide these issues are critical and can we jointly solve. So a lot of our mandates and agendas are set by uh, joint consultation with the government. Uh, within that, uh, what came out that the government said that choose four states where you try out different pilots for providing these sustainable business models uh, based solutions and then we can roll it out across the country. So we are in that phase working in states of Bihar, UP, Uttarakhand, and West Bengal. And we are working on a number of technologies. We are working on solar water pumps. We are working on clean cooker stoves. We are working on solar home lighting. We are also working on mini grid and micro grid. We are also working on improved water mills. And we are working on a number of approaches. But I will take uh, you know, a, a more detailed approach here to talk about the, some work that we are doing in clean cooking. So as Ajayta pointed out, there are certain work that does not fall within the ambit of the work of the financier or the entrepreneurs or manufacturers. 
there is need for some third party to do that <laughs> in order to <laughs> have all the three succeed in that uh, endeavor that they're making. And uh, so we had a mandate, so, you know, develop successful business models. So we talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, we talked to a lot of sector players saying that, what are the challenges you face? So that we can understand whether there is a possibility of developing that. And uh, there were many responses in clean cooking and uh, I, then we realized that all these responses can be clubbed in three categories. Uh, demand, supply and ecosystem development. On demand front, we encountered two major challenges. People said that there's no demand for clean cooker stoves. We don't find a person walking to a store and saying that I want a clean cooker stoves. Uh, never happens. The second thing is that even those people who somehow got convinced that okay, they need a clean cooker stoves, uh, they hear the price, they see the product and they say, oh, I think I'm better off using my traditional cooker stove. The second challenge, what Ajita said that, when a distributor like Ajita or entrepreneur like Ajita or somebody, a financer like Arohan or Pullerton steps into the market, they are completely, you know, clueless about what kind of product this would stock or what kind of product this would support. And identifying a product is a huge challenge. It's much more complicated in certain categories than uh, compared to others. For example, lighting has a very, you know, uh, simple solution. You switch it on, you get light. Cooker stoves are not like that. Cooker stoves, you know, the performance, the preferences vary a lot. You know, you, you might have a different kind of fuel, your cooker stove performance will vary. You need to cook something different, you need different kind of cooker stoves. You have a large family, you need different kind of cooker stoves. So what kind of cooker stove they should see? So we started looking at what we can do in that space. And then we identified uh, some work that we can do in each category. So the first category that we chose to work was, you know, identifying the right kind of cooker stoves for a particular area. Can we do that? So we did a large study. We uh, used a framework where we did not go for the lab certification in the first page. We just went to the user saying that use these five, six cooker stoves and tell me what you like about this and what you don't like about this. So we got that information. We, we are making it public and helping you know, people like Ajita and others to uh, identify the cooker stoves. The second thing we realized is that there is a huge uh, price and value proposition uh, uh, you know, mismatch in the mind of uh, consumers. So cooker stove being a 2,000 rupee to 2,500 to 3,000 rupee commodity, it's not that difficult. We have uh, a good example, often quoted example of mobile phones you know, going off the shelf in the same price category without much support from the sector. So there is a you know, capacity to pay. Cooker stove did not go into that direction. The problem was that people do not understand why they should pay 2,000 rupees for a cooker stove where they have been using a traditional cooker stove which was free. So what we did that, can we change the perception? Can we make the health and environmental benefits so attractive that they understand the value much more detailed and much more, you know, uh, in nuanced manner? So what we did that, we realized that most of our entrepreneurs, being a startup or being driven by self-funding, and uh, unfortunately, I can't say that the cooker stove entrepreneurs are getting the same kind of uh, attention what the solar uh, home systems or solar lighting got. So we said that, hey, what can we do here? And we realized that, can we take up some of the costs that they have to incur? And what are those costs? So we said, okay, let's take three examples. So one is that, can we reduce the cost of capital to the financiers? Is there a possibility that the credit line can be extended to MFIs, which is lower than the market price for this particular purpose? So as of now, the same money can be used to four or five users being used to cook a store, which already has some challenges. So can we incentivize the players who want to go into that space? The second thing with that, can we develop a concept? What C highlighted, the selling of concept is a tough task. It's not part of entrepreneurs mandate to sell a concept. They want to sell a product. Somebody else had to sell the concept that there is a problem, you need to solve the problems, and there are entrepreneurs who have the solutions. You go and choose the solutions. We said, we establish the problem, we will highlight that you need to move from traditional to improved cooker stoves. And then let the entrepreneur provide the options and they choose. So we uh, went mainstream, uh, you know, we went to all the advertising company, we looked at all the approaches tried out across the world and see, uh, can we develop two different type of communication strategy. One, to highlight the problem. So basically what we say, concept or awareness creation. And second, product communication. So we said the first one we targeted to the government philanthropic agencies that they see the content, they see the mandate, and run up campaign which was similar to, or which can be similar to the polio campaign that we did. 
Folio was a huge campaign run across all the state uh, you know, agencies, all the people coming together highlighting the, you know, the uh, impact of polio. Something similar can be done for this particular category that is indoor pollution. The second thing we did that entrepreneurs often you know, try ad hoc strategy, a poster, a demonstration, a very varied sales speech which have not been trained. You know, one surprising thing that, uh, thing that I found that if you take Unilever, they go to sell a detergent soap uh, which is well supported by marketing efforts. The person who is selling has a very high incentive to sell the product, very high salary, very good training and he is selling a product which everybody wants. Think of a person going to sell a cook stove. The person gets three to 4,000 rupees salary in the market, no advertising marketing support and he is selling a product which is much more complicated. First you have to sell the concept, then sell the product, then answer so many questions which he myself not be aware of. So can we take that cost on the ecosystem? So we started creating that kind of concept. So the second thing. Third thing we realized that in ecosystem, we often find that the government policy maker talking about certain topics, but they don't have a clear credential of what needs to be done. So they often say, okay, you have been talking about solving the problem. Can you suggest what can be done? Last year we initiated a, a forum called India Clean Cooking Forum which we want to keep on running till the time the clean cooking comes very high on the agenda of the policy makers. We are part of MNRA, we work with them, so they also realize and they are helping us and they are agreeing to some extent on a lot of things that I'm saying here and we see a change happening there. So I think, uh, you know, what I'm saying that in order to these people to succeed, we need the support system to be much more proactive and uh, Agencies like GIZ, IFC, World Bank, uh, any of these firms, they can play a very crucial role in setting up the sector like they did for microfinance, like they did for uh, solar uh, or other renewable energy. Um, incredibly informative. So I actually want to throw it back to the MFIs, Rohan and Fullerton, uh, when we discuss uh, the awareness that GIZ would be doing as well as the capital, which always is exciting if, if MFIs can get capital below cost. Are, are those things that are really going to address your issues in, in legal and regulatory environment? And, you know, what is your response to that? Um, we are a, just to reintroduce my organization, we actually started out as a, we are a concept to, in this space, we are a concept to collection uh, organization. So we start from creating the awareness. Uh, uh, before all of this, it was something that we had envisaged that we need to do. And so we, and we realized that there was no awareness. So we started creating from uh, using our workforce to create the awareness with this large customer base that we had. Uh, and then we already had the reach and the accessibility to this uh, base of customers in, the large, in a large geography. Uh, so we created the awareness. Then we uh, uh, also did all the demonstration to make it acceptable to them. Uh, so in the space, in the in the case of cook stoves, we had to actually conduct uh, a la first. We seeded the market by actually giving out cook stoves uh, to people uh, in the to chosen people in the villages to to use and uh, and uh, and talk about their experience. And if they liked it, then they would come forward and say, "Yes, I want to buy one." Uh, and then the news would spread and everybody would start using. Uh, to speed that up, we also conducted innovative things like cooking competitions for women in the villages so that they all get to see the, the efficiency of the cook stove, that it doesn't create so much smoke and uh, can cook faster and uses lesser wood and so on. So these kind of interventions and marketing activities needed to be conducted. So after acceptability, then the biggest challenge was to, uh, you know, make it affordable to them. So affordability came through actually giving them an innovative financial product, which could be uh, delivered to them at a, in a viable way for us. Otherwise, funding things from 600 rupees to 60,000 rupees is what we can do today because we have a viable financial product uh, and we have we, uh, leveraged this reach that we have with our large workforce with this customer base to be able to do that. So. Concept creation like what GIZ is now getting into would be a great help because it would create a demand uh, and would minimize our efforts in this. However, I don't see that, uh, I mean, uh, especially in our case, we would like to continue to do the marketing effort because it is we have access to the customer. Uh, they trust us because we are uh, a financier first to them and then uh, a marketer of other products to them. Uh, and therefore, uh, we need to, we have a large vested interest in making sure that uh, they trust us and they, they will repay us uh, in time. So that is something that we will continue to do because we are not only going to be doing cook stoves and solar lamps and so on, but we are into the space where we will market tractors.
tractors and commercial vehicles and motorcycles and so on. So there are some products like bicycles which did not need any marketing. People knew what a bicycle can do and uh, where they can fix it if there is a, is a problem uh, and if there is a puncher they know that they need to go to a puncher shop but uh, in the case of a cook stove or a solar lamp they would come back to us and therefore we needed to have a watertight warranty and guarantee uh, backing from the manufacturer. So because we only market the product, we don't do the order fulfillment which was the biggest challenge. So we had to actually identify many of these manufacturers did not have a distributor to. So while GIZ might address the concept part of it and help create the demand, uh, there was a distribution, there's a, the distributor is a very uh, key person in this whole thing, a whole uh, uh, process because there has to be, the, the orders have to get fulfilled and the product has to reach the doorstep of the customer and then later on after sales service also is extremely important. So many manufacturers have walked into this space uh, first to because there was this large market and a lucrative market and, and so on but then they did not uh, prepare themselves for the after sales and uh, only organizations that have really done well on the after sales front have been able to get into uh, this space and be successful. So these are some challenges that will remain and I think uh, it's uh, we therefore actually evaluate every product that we want to get uh, into first evaluate the need and if there is a need uh, then evaluate the product and then uh, do the concept selling and then get into it. There is a need but right now people are just looking at you know convenience so therefore now we have come up to the area the, the um, level of offering a convenience of financing for a product that they would like to that they need. Uh, they are not in the space of conservation and all yet uh, because it's a long way off. They are not thinking about saving the forests by using cook stoves or saving kerosene by using solar lamps and so on. That's a long way off. But we still are trying to, uh, in the concept selling, emphasizing the whole health, both the economic and the healthcare aspects, uh, which I think has uh, slowly caught on. Uh, first it was only the economic aspect, now even the healthcare aspect has started sort of sinking in to the consumers. Can I actually just comment quickly? Okay. Um, so, um, so while theoretically that's all true, um, uh, uh, in practice, I mean, fundamentally the challenge is that there's an incentive issue for one field staff to focus on selling 17 products uh, and then also trying to get a loan for it. There's, um, there is a conversion issue. Um, there's a, a timing issue. Um, and then there is that delivery issue. I think, I think that those parts will always exist as, irrespective of, uh, of the concept sell for sure. But at the end of the day, you're easing their job. I mean, I'll tell you, like, even specifically for, uh, for, for our relationship with Fullerton, we've been doing solar lights, right? Um, the field staff aren't properly trained. You know, they have five minutes to sell a solar lantern, which we already all decided is very difficult to sell. So I have my entire team on the field staff right now. They're calling them regularly, checking on them. We're getting in touch with customers. We're having to go and do night demos at a period where there's no center meetings, right? Um, so I think that there is a parallel presence that has to be there. Um, today, if you're gonna do after sales service, it doesn't matter if the manufacturer says it's a two year guarantee. Is he gonna then deliver the product within a day, you know, uh, when the product is supposed to be replaced? The answer is no. You're gonna need to localize this, right? And so, um, and I think the burden of all of these things shouldn't be put on one institution. Um, and I think that's the reason why you have these partnerships. Um, and, and with that said, even, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that we don't know how to sell a cook stove properly. And the reality is no matter how many games that you play or like jai sessions that you do by making these women sit together, on a cost perspective, I'm not gonna do that every day. Um, there's no way because my margin is so small that it's, there's no way I'm going to actually make this into a cost-effective initiative. I can make it into a CSR initiative, but it won't be a market-based solution. So that's, I, I think, the reason for why you know, the work that you guys would be doing needs to happen. We had uh, cook stove companies that came to us and promised these things to us, but didn't follow through because they don't have manpower in the places that we're operating in. Right, so I mean, there, I think there are fundamental challenges, which is why I think that cross-sector, uh, sector level uh, intervention is gonna be a really important fact. Add to it. So, uh, while we talked about the cooker stoves, I can tell you that this is not very generic to cooker stove. Uh, the challenges might be different, but the market development approach requires, for example, I will take a very short example of solar water pumps. A very high value product compared to cooker stoves. Uh, existing demand, people know that solar water pumps give water without diesel, so they understand the value, but the price point is very high. 
nobody is going to pay 2 lakh rupees for a pump where the diesel pump is available for 30,000 rupees. What can be done there? And I give you an example where we went there and we were trying to support a company which is launching uh, solar water pumps and they say, can you tell us how the pump looks like? And unfortunately, you could not find that we had a proper picture with the company to showcase or a video to show that, okay, this is how the solar water pumps look like. And they say, if you are going to sell a product, if we have not seen that, we don't know how it performs, how you expect us to pay 2 lakh rupees even if we get money somehow? What we did that we created a demonstration site in that area, right? I realized that the demonstration site creation would have never been possible if the entrepreneur, you know, wanted to do that because there are so many challenges that we got. Well, we have ideas. Okay. We know what we want to do <laughs> yes. because we actually know the customer Absolutely. really well. But the difference is, I think it's it's about uh, funding for the execution and justifying it again on a market Absolutely. basis. So what we do that we try to create the market and then they step in. Now I have like four or five manufacturers saying that okay, we have the product now. I will go to their different site and we'll sell the product, and that will reduce a lot of cost for them. Cost of reaching out to customer, cost of you know demonstration of the technology, cost of building you know confidence in a particular thing because we have shown that this thing works. So I think we we are not saying that we can do what this guy can do. No, we we exist because of you know their importance. We are there to support because they are fighting for a cause. A GIZ is a development agency. We are implementing a development project. We are not into a for profit mandate. But what we realize that certain in you know, intervention need to have a very, very collaborative approach from beginning. Later on, the market forces can take care of that. So the initial uh, support is very well required for anything that is emerging in rural or sustainable business uh, concept. No, that's that's actually a very good point, Santosh. Uh, I don't think the discussion is around whether a social enterprise should also do anything beyond its core activity, right? So I think all of us understand that if you want to make the business uh, sustainable if you really want to achieve that social impact that you want to do you have to do things beyond what you do in terms of your core business really the question is as you rightly said about somebody taking on that extra effort in terms of mapping the ecosystem in terms of looking at options something what what she does uh, uh, in terms of looking at what are the options available and then giving us specialist advice and my feeling also is that depending on the geography in which you're operating Right? Because what we are really trying to explain are all very subtle things. As you rightly said, when a diesel pump is available for 30,000 rupees, it is a huge challenge to convince somebody that you need to buy something at 2 lakh rupees. Right? And that's really where interventions in terms of uh, that information getting passed, that awareness being created right, about the pollution aspect, about the comfort aspect, and the fact that it needs to be incentivized even to the end consumer in terms of a better interest rate. Right? So as long as you can, you can uh, pick up themes which are critical to the geography that you're operating. As I said earlier also, that it is not that solar lantern is required in West Bengal. Right? West Bengal has decent level of electricity, whereas Bihar, certainly there is something which, which needs to be done there. So as long as you can understand from the MFI perspective, you can weave in that with the customers that we work with and really take one theme at a time because too many things being done together also will not work and it will leave everybody confused whether it's a customer or, or, or basically even our staff. So uh, the ecosystem being developed, aggregators like, like Frontier Markets who can help us do that initial pre-work and then run a theme starting with customer education. Like somebody said, there is that half an hour interaction that we have with that group of ladies every month or every fortnight depending on the, on the frequency of payment. So how do you initially sort of seed an idea Right? bring in the relevant details and talk about that over a period of let's say three to four months. If you straight away try to sell something, then it will be seen as a hard sell and then it will it'll basically boomerang. Right? So a, a well thought out ge geography specific uh, approach starting with literacy uh, awareness coupled with the kind of support structure that people like GIZ can do in terms of the sector mapping, the aggregators coming in and then one thing at a time. Right, is really, is really, I would say, the, uh, you know, the way to go is. The, the other part that I actually think that we haven't addressed in terms of um, where the MFI plays a very interesting role in this is that at the end of the day, you are creating business loans for these women. Um, and what I think is really exciting because, I mean, we've done this with a couple of our microfinance partners in Rajasthan where, um, you know, once you've 
built that need or you've identified that demand and there are people beyond the MFI that want to start purchasing this product, um, the women are getting business loans to then start becoming salespeople, you know, and they're earning income. And suddenly it's no longer that 30 percent, it's going back to the 100 percent. And I think that this is something that, you know, folks like us can do. Um, and and why, why do they take the confidence in taking it on is because of the after sales service piece of this, right, which I think is... Um, also really crucial. Um, you know, one, one experiment, and uh, Ravi, I don't know if you know this, but um, we've been talking about this with your team, is we've been looking at the numbers that have been coming from Rajasthan up until we didn't exist. And we're trying to see whether or not if we exist, do those numbers go up, but also do you actually keep more money in your pocket, right? Um, and really try to understand, again, is there an effective way to do this and with better collaborations that we can actually get more better products to, this, to the BOP and finance it properly so that it can scale. That's a good point. I think um, in order to get this to scale, we have to make it profitable for the MFI and the enterprise. And I think we had some debate internally in our group about the right business model. So whether it, Fullerton, who started out really as a full service MFI in terms of marketing and distribution of the product and even some after sale services, if I'm correct. No, not I'm not no, no. Okay. So we, we had some marketing and distribution on that end. And then we, we discussed with Rohan that they're really so focused on their core business as an MFI that that's not really interesting to them in terms of, of profitability. And so Frontier Markets has taken on a, a more... Um, a, Broader, a uh, broader approach in terms of marketing after sales service and partnership with the MFI. So, which which is the business model that will work? I actually was approached by an entrepreneur just before this session saying, "I sell a great BOP product. I want to partner with an MFI. How do how do you get started? And and how do you think about what's right for you as an entrepreneur and your product, and what's right for the MFI? And will this increase MFI profitability? Can I, can I actually uh, take that as an example? Um, so, uh, we had done a marketplace activity where there were seven. Uh, different solar companies that came to pitch their products to channels, NGOs, MFIs, etc. in Rajasthan. And I saw the faces of all of the heads of the microfinance institution just looking a little lost and overwhelmed, right? Because how do you choose between seven manufacturers who are all saying they have the best product, best guarantee, best price point, etc. Everything's the best, right? And then naturally what's going on in their minds is going, well, which one is my customer going to choose? Albeit, not every household of their customers are going to choose the same thing. So are they really going to take on seven different manufacturers and take volume and stock it and then take a risk? Absolutely not. Right? And so what ends up happening is they go, as you think, you decide. Which one do you think we should start off with? Which one do you think is going to work? Because we know the customer as well as they do. And we say, yeah, let's, let us be the aggregator. Let us take the risk. Let's supply all of it. Let's let them choose, but let's make sure it's the right product. So today when a BOP manufacturer comes up, they come straight to us first because they say, look, you can decide how to get our product to market. Um, and then I have to decide, um, working with my partner, that is this something that's going to be good for your customer or not? Here are the risks. Here's where I'm going to mitigate that risk. And then we make a decision collectively, right? And then that's when you can actually see this working really well. So some BOP manufacturers might not come to Rajasthan at all. Some might only go to Tamil Nadu, right? But the point is that you have to have that collective discussion and someone to take on that aggregating role to make it happen. Yeah, I, I don't really think uh, making profit or sort of making a surplus in these kind of activities is really the core focus because uh, we do make enough amount of money as far as the credit <laughs> product is concerned. Uh, really, as I said, uh, it's, it, it's coming more from the other side of the fear of your wonderful relationship with the customer getting sabotaged in some way, right? Because all of us see our customers as somebody who should ideally grow with us. The first cycle loan moves to the second and the third and the fourth. Obviously, the loan uh, sizes go up, the loan tenors change. So automatically, there is that 30% available to do other stuff, right? Uh, so it's more about we feeling comfortable that uh, what I am putting my neck on the line in terms of taking to my customer is something that I can stand by and not cut a sorry figure after six months or nine months when the product needs some product uh, service or some part needs to be changed because the ultimate fear in our mind is that we have funded this particular uh, uh, item and let's say nine months down the line it doesn't work and the lady says take us away to apne becha hamko so it's not working so you get it repaired and then I'll pay you so our core loan then gets 
stuck in terms of repayment. So that really is the is the point. Apart from the fact that I think since you're dealing with BOP customers uh, who are vulnerable, the last thing that you want to do is to give them a feeling that the company is selling it, which is giving you the loan, so you have to buy it. Right? So to be fair and transparent, for example, when we sell our micro pensions and insurance, it's a rule in our company that it is never sold along with the loan. You take the loan, after about two or three months, separately somebody else will talk to you about micro pensions and insurance. If you're interested, you buy it. Right? So automatically, you need to take that extra responsibility onto yourself in ensuring that you're not, you're not pushing something down the throat of somebody who may not sort of completely require it. So just to summarize, I mean, we, we all feel the need to get engaged on a much better platform. Uh, additional hooks with the customer will only make our relationship stronger. But that fear about will it go bad and then finally will that sort of spoil my relationship is really what is the foremost. Money, of course, I mean, if something comes to the field officer who's putting that extra effort, something comes to the branch manager who's monitoring that, welcome, right? It'll only help them be motivated to actually sell. But from a company perspective, frankly, it's, it's more about that additional hook. Yeah, just to add to what Manoj said, uh, there are two things that I think uh, some, uh, we miss out in this whole uh, uh, discussion uh, normally. First is that, uh, first of all, we are not an MFI like our own. Uh, we are a, a normal NBFC. So most of the customers uh, that we target or are, are in our fold today have uh, incomes of more than a lakh and a half uh, per year. So they're not technically, uh, they don't fall in the, in the microfinance category. However, all these products that we're talking about are actually uh, marketed to this segment uh, and they too require financing. Uh, and uh, so, we, so since these are, this is what our customer base is. So there is a, and, uh, you know, there's a feeling that this, these products are only should be targeted only to the really bottom of the pyramid uh, and to the poor and and people who are really needy and so on. But it's not so. It, there is a there is a huge um, base of customers that that need these products because power availability is a is a challenge for everybody in the rural areas uh, and therefore everybody needs a solar lamp uh, so for, and affordability also is a, a big problem so while they might buy the top of the list in terms of priority might be to buy a mobile phone today because it's it's not a consumption product for them in the rural areas it's actually a a business tool for them uh, today as we see it so we don't finance it but and so therefore the cook stove might come down far below in the in the list of things uh, a solar lamp might come a little higher and water filters might come below so it's a it's a huge task of concept creation that needs to be done uh, because they need it and they will ultimately save a lot of money so that is uh, required to be done the second part is that uh, uh, not all organizations actually there is a space for all the uh, kinds of organization to coexist both the microfinance the manufacturer distributors like ajaytas and so on because uh, while we had the um, monies and the and the finances available with us to actually invest in this business when there was no distributor available in each every place that we were going to and we we could not operate without a distributor in the middle so we actually created a middleman who acted as a distributor just to channelize the whole order and order fulfillment when most of the hard work was being done by us. Uh, secondly, it needed us to invest in stocks, stocks for the distributor, not for us because we can't, we don't stock. So to seed the market, to, to get, invest in samples that we would put into the market and we would be, and the distributor did not want to become a distributor uh, and stock goods and therefore we had to give him an advance, a tax, uh, interest-free advance and we invested close to about a crore and a half in the first few year or so to be able to create this whole ecosystem for the distributor and the manufacturer and us to be able to finally reach the product to the, uh, to the end consumer. This is not possible for every organization to do. Uh, we, we were forced to do it, of course. We, would not, we did not want to get into it, but there was no other way to make this succeed. And therefore, we had to get into it. And not all organizations will have the wherewithal to do this. Uh, and if you want to real, really reach out to the rest of the all the 600,000 villages, I think uh, we will need both the, an efficient distribution system through organizations like Frontier. We need the microfinance organizations to get into it and, and feel that this is a viable thing for them to get into without jeopardizing their core business. And for the manufacturers to actually hel help channelize this whole product to the end consumer through the distribution system, liaising with the financier financiers in the middle as well. 
Great. I think there's a lot of questions um, that we all have, so we want to make sure we give that to the time to you guys as as participants. So I think there should be somebody with a microphone. Um, as if you could stand up, say your name, organization, and question. Hi, Mitra Arjun from Lumita Networks, and we do pay-as-you-go technology for solar companies. And I'm interested in bringing the topic back to finance at scale. And I mean, Minoj, you've articulated and repeated the sentiment that was very clear at the UNCDF conference on this topic that showed why MFIs won't be able to do energy at scale. Um, and we've been working with a number of investors on how do you finance pay-as-you-go systems, which is our focus, right? And clearly that has to be done through distributors and integrators of microgrids. And one of the challenges that keeps coming up, which I'm interested in the perspective on, is, is who the counterparty is. Because if you're going to do it at scale, neither the distributors nor the microgrid installers have the balance sheets that can hold loans of the size that's needed to tackle this problem at scale. And if we're not going to tackle it at scale, there's no point in doing it, right? So how are we going to do that? How are we going to reach them at scale? Uh, two things I said. Uh, first of all, as I said, we not only invested in uh, setting up this whole uh, distribution, uh, helping the distributor to really set himself up for helping us, actually. We also had to invest in a whole computerized loan booking system uh, that would help channelize the orders very uh, efficiently. The monies would get delivered to the manufacturer and then the, the orders would get fulfilled. So this is a very important aspect which, which helps the whole uh, order fulfillment process. Uh, I don't think, uh, we, I mean we personally don't have uh, any um, funding issue. So therefore, uh, today we, we in the merchandising space, we actually fund everything from 600 rupees up to 600,000. Uh, we are now funding solar water pumps, uh, wind turbines, uh, home energy solutions and so on, which is at the higher end, uh, which go up to about 300,000, 400,000 and so on. So the ticket size is not a problem. It might be microfinance organizations will be restricted to certain ticket sizes. We are not an MFI, so we, have, we are able to go beyond that. Uh, and uh, overall liquidity is not an issue today, even for microfinance organizations. They are able to access liquidity. Uh, however, uh, you know, how large the order might, uh, the uh, volume might be, I don't think it will exceed any MFI's uh, portfolio by more than 2-3%. So it's not going to really affect their uh, portfolio as well in terms of uh, volume. But if you put all of the organizations together across the country, then you can attain scale. Uh, we are an organization, we are present in about 180 branches, 330,000 uh, villages, but there are MFIs like Bandhan and SKS and Spandana and all that who are far larger in terms of reach. So it just matters uh, what uh, it, it will succeed in terms of scale or it will attain scale if they all get into it in a, in a very phased manner, in a, in a selective manner and if the distribution setup is there. And, but money should not be an issue, I think. Um. So I actually think that there's another problem here that we're not addressing, which is the fundamental fear that the customer doesn't want your product, right? There's a fundamental fear here, right? So theoretically, um, everything that Ravi said is absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of presence of microfinance institutions. Money is actually not an issue. It's only an issue if you can't collect your payment, right? And what is the fear of collecting? The fear in, in your question is that they might not pay you back. So they might not value the, the, the product or the technology, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the elephant in the room, right? So, um, but if theoretically, if there was value for the product, there's a clear understanding of its use, then a pay-as-you-go solution actually works quite parallelly well with, uh, with the lending model. But the key is in the design. Um, is the product priced in a way that it actually could do collections uh, based on the schedules that the MFI has? Is it priced at the right amount? I mean, how are you designing this to actually work with the MFI who's the financier and then making sure that you have the system in place to work with the distributor that can actually get it into market at the right time and service it? So it's really, again, the onus is on the manufacturer to understand how they should be designing this to work within the ecosystem that we've created. I think each, each product and each uh, service is really unique. So obviously the, the approach that you would use to a 2,000 rupee, let's say water purifier compared to a 1,000 rupees solar lamp or maybe something which is 5,000, 6,000 rupees is, you know, is going to be different. I think from a sectoral perspective, if you look at it, 25,000 uh, 25, crores is really the MFI outstanding as of, let's say, December. Even if you take 30% of that, you're talking about almost 7,500 crores. So, Potential is available, funding as, as Ravi said is available. It's just a question of that 
you know sort of uh, being synchronized enough in terms of what the MFIs see as a genuine requirement uh, for their clients. A process which is already ironed out so that you don't go through by reinventing the wheel each time you try, try it out with a new, new company or a new product and how non-disruptive it can be to your business operations. Because for us the foremost criteria is that it should not disrupt our core business. How do you piggyback on our processes? How do you piggyback on the same people who actually do the loan? So if it's a very complicated product and you need let's say an area manager to go and explain then uh, you know then it's going to be a complete uh, completely different process. So the loan officer who's typically a SSC um, you know matriculate pass or fail is really your interface point unless it's a different approach where you have people who will do that customer uh, sort of awareness and uh, sort of education program differently. Can I right? So I, I mean the point that I'm trying to say is that there is no problem which can't be solved. It's just a question of sitting down across the table and seeing whether it's a genuine need and how do we work out on the process. Yeah, I, I think the market has to evolve. It just like in the case of um, cars and commercial vehicles where the onus of collection on a, any loan given to buy a car or a commercial vehicle is on the financier and not on the manufacturer. In the same way, even in this, the onus of collection, we are a concept to collection organization as I said. And so the collection ultimately is my uh, responsibility. So therefore, I will assess the customer, his repayment ability, his bureau records, his repayment track record and all of that and only then lend to the customer. Once we have lent to the customer, uh, unless the product fails, I mean, in this, it's because it's a concept product today, uh, and we've already accepted it as, as being good quality and all that. The onus of collection remains with the financier. So therefore, it's not uh, on the so, and and we actually pay the manufacturer upfront. So if a product costs ten thousand rupees, I pay the manufacturer ten thousand rupees upfront, which is the financing amount, and the manufacturer then supplies the uh, product to the customer. And after that, the relationship customer is what we are looking at and he, we collect from the customer. There are some high value items like solar lamps, uh, solar um, based uh, uh, solar powered pumps for example, where we are trying to work out with the manufacturer to put a chip into the, uh, you know, the inverter where in, in case uh, and th this will be controlled remotely. So in case the customer does not repay us, yes, uh, then we can, he can control the chip from there. Like uh, I think uh, the Simpa Networks has done in, uh, in Bangalore for the inverters. So that is, that is what we are trying to work out. So in case there is a repayment problem, we can ask them to switch off the system and we can go back to the customer and say unless you pay us, your system will not switch on again. Things like that can also be done. Uh, which will mitigate the risk and will encourage financiers to get into that space to finance this way. Once solar pumps become popular and become a, a, a product as normal as a, as a bicycle or a motorcycle, uh, then you will not have to uh, have a need for that as well. Just, just quickly to add to it. Very quick. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, just addressing the problem of scale, uh, the two gentlemen said one thing which basically highlight, this is not their core business. Somebody has to make it their core business. As of now, we are trying to get somebody to do something which they are not supposed to do. They will face challenges. This is like car financing 30, 40 years back. Banks were supposed to give loan and there were no car financing company. Now you go into the market, you have tons of companies which are doing, you know. So what we, to reach the scale, we need people who are dedicated for this job. Anyone who has multiple objectives will choose the objective which gives most return with the less amount of effort. So, you know, that's probably the answer for in my opinion, to scale. I think that's a great point. And with that note, I want to thank um, all of our participants. And I think um, it's been an incredible discussion. There are a lot of questions, but I think that was a great discussion in terms of solutions and answers. So to Santosh, to Ravi, to Manoj, and to Ajita, thank you very much. And I think Sankalpas, um, a few things for you.